Hello and welcome to a very, very special episode of the Alexandra Wenman Show today. Today I am joined by Eben Alexander and Karen Newell and I'm so excited to have you both here. I think that you guys need no introduction really, <laughs> um, but just for the viewers who, who, who for some reason might not be familiar with, uh, with your work, can you tell us a little bit about, Eben, I think I'll start with you about your journey to heaven first of all. Uh, can you share a little bit about your experience of that? Yes. Um, I think it's important to point out that I had spent the 54 years of my life leading up to my coma and my NDE, my near-death experience, um, working in the, in the scientific world. I was a neurosurgeon. I taught for 15 years at Harvard Medical School, thought I understood something about brain, mind, and consciousness, and all that got completely flipped on its head in November of 2008. That's when I went uh, into deep coma over three and a half hours with a severe gram-negative bacterial meningitis. That's about the worst kind you can have. Uh, all the medical documentation in my case showed a brain that was uh, horrifically inactivated with all eight lobes of my brain affected. And yet I had this profound, extraordinary, ultra-real spiritual experience that, uh, of course, I described in the book Proof of Heaven. Uh, but I look at proof of heaven as a question mark because this, this strong spiritual experience, um, you know, the scientific world takes note because of the damage to my brain that should not have allowed for any such experience and should actually not have allowed for any recovery because I went from a 10% chance of survival at the beginning of my week in coma to a 2% chance by the end. Uh, I mean, I was, uh, I was in, in very dire straits and yet when I came back to this world, even though my brain initially was very wrecked, I didn't even recognize my loved ones at the bedside, my mother, my sisters, my sons, uh, and yet I had a rapid recovery. And that is the part that really demands uh, tremendous attention. There's a case report that came out um, in September of 2018 in Journal of Nervous and Mental Diseases that fully supports the extent of my damaged brain. And uh, yeah. so this is really just about an, an awakening. And uh, uh, I've come to realize so much more about the nature of consciousness and kind of the reality of our free will. Uh, and the biggest blessing, of course, was in November 2011, when I met uh, my life partner uh, and co-author of the third book, Living in a Mindful Universe, Karen Newell. And uh, that's where I really started to more fully develop my notions of love and mind and heart consciousness and uh, all of that. Beautiful, isn't it? Because the two of you, you know, come together through the, through the consciousness um, work and now it's like bridging worlds with it, aren't you? So Karen, tell us a little bit about your work. Well, the bridging of worlds happened between Evan and I from the very first moment we met because I knew he had had a powerful near-death experience during that coma he spoke of. And, and he, you know, many people who have these kind of experiences end up learning very deep personal lessons. And so I was curious, you know, what, what, what did you learn? What transformed you after this experience? And he says, the brain doesn't create consciousness. So he was very much in this scientific mind. And I was confused. And I said, well, why would anyone think the brain creates consciousness? <laughs> that kind of <clears throat> really right away put us at two opposite ends of the spectrum. Eben as a materialist scientist and me as a very open-minded person who hadn't really picked one particular religion or dogma to follow, but I always searched for the universal truths among all the many spiritual traditions. And I had found out for myself through direct personal experience how to kind of open myself to those realms, how to make that information useful in my daily life, not just as kind of an idle curiosity, but how can bringing a sense of spirit or soul or love into one's life very consciously, how can that really affect our unfolding reality. And so we did come from these two different uh, backgrounds. And yet Eben's goal after his near-death experience was to bridge science and spirituality. And so that's where I came in. I had this depth of knowledge of different spiritual traditions and different practices. And that's really where our collaboration really began. Karen, I want to ask you, can you, do you have, uh, I know, cause I'm sort of having, 
very similar experiences and I think that your work and mine probably are quite similar in many ways um, or experiences. But I wanted to know if you have had a direct experience of your other lives. I have had memories of past lives. Yes, absolutely. And it's very interesting because what there's one in particular that I've gotten fragments of over time. And it all has built together into this big picture. And what it's done for me is really given me an understanding of how that particular lifetime, the one directly before this one, has prepared me for many of the challenges that I'm facing in this lifetime. And uh, so that, to me, is what's so useful about kind of understanding the big picture of how our soul or spirit evolves from one lifetime to the next, not just within this particular one. Yeah, and I'm interested to speak to both of you, obviously, about other dimensions and other levels of consciousness um, from, from where I sit. And, I, and, I, and I, I'm going to come to you as well in a minute, Evan, but from where I'm sitting at the moment um, and tuning in around Karen, you seem as a soul, like, I mean, we're all as a soul very otherworldly, but for me, you're, you're almost otherworldly. There's something quite celestial about you. So I'm wondering, have you had any memories or insights of lives in other dimensions as well i really my my sense is not necessarily in other dimensions but i feel a direct connection to source whatever mm. you want to call that when mm. i when i use the word god it reminds me of my methodist religious upbringing and so i like to use words that maybe don't trigger those kinds of uh, dogmatic memories but i feel a direct connection to source I feel as though I can connect to this amazing sense of universal love and compassion, not as a separate thing from me, but something that I am absolutely connected to and can be a conduit really for bringing that love to this world. And so if that is considered other dimensional, <laughs> um, that's not really usually how I put it because I've, I'm very interested in grounding this kind of energy in the here and now world to really help transform our mm -hmm. current state of humanity. So Evan has always been focused on the worldview, the materialist worldview, the ideas, the thoughts, that have brought us here. Whereas I'm more interested in how we interact with each other. How do our feelings and our way of being, how can those transform so that as humanity, we can really come together. And so uh, that's where talk of other dimensions always leads me back to how can that be brought to this world to improve what is going on in this current state of earth that we're all experiencing. Absolutely. I think it, all, all of it needs to be grounded into our everyday, doesn't it? Otherwise, what's the point? There can be so much escapism in a lot of this, as we know. Um, but it's wonderful that you guys are doing that work because I think it needs to come into a lot more of the systems that we have in place in our society today. So I, uh, talking about what's going on on the planet at the moment, I think there are, there are obviously quite a lot of people going through traumatic times and losing loved ones. Um, Eben, what would you say to them about, you know, your experience of the other side? Could you, could you offer them a little insight into what it's like on the other side just to give those people some comfort? Well, yes, I think it's important to point out that... Uh, when you, when you encounter it, not just from my own personal experience, which was a very powerful uh, kind of indicator of the beautiful love and, and comfort that that's our spiritual home. There really is absolutely nothing to be afraid of. It's an extraordinary realm where, in fact, our uh, conscious awareness and kind of sense of self and mission expands tremendously. Um, but the good news is you can approach all that through meditation, and that's why Pierre and I love the work we do. Uh, but getting back to your question, um, you know, there's also been 11 years of intense scientific work on my part to make sense of this, and I collaborate with mm -hmm. scientists all around the world um, in, in understanding this. And many people, especially early on, ask me, well, what do your skeptical, you know, scientific colleagues think of all this? Well, it turns out very few of them were, you know, quote, skeptical in terms of doubting the empirical data of my journey. Uh, and in fact, many of them, especially those who are interested in consciousness, uh, have gone a far way beyond where I was before my coma. 
Uh, and this is where I think it's important because it's not just my viewpoint based on my personal experience and an extraordinary near-death experience because millions of people have had such experiences. Mm -hmm. And there are um, scientists who study them. Uh, and uh, this is a tremendous blessing for the world because, in fact, all of that science of the study of consciousness is moving in a direction that is very favorable to a far more harmonious and peaceful world. You have to remember that most of our society's kind of uh, uh, assumptions about reality are based in our scientific kind of database of, of knowledge and understanding and worldviews. And materialism, that is, that only the physical world exists, also known as physicalism, was kind of the dominant mode. I mean, certainly for me, that's what I had worshipped before my coma. And yet, uh, what I came to realize is that consciousness is fundamental. And that's where quantum physics has tried to lead us and modern science of consciousness, all these studies, in fact, all the evidence for reincarnation, uh, which is scientifically promoted, for example, from um, University of Virginia Division of Perceptual Studies, 2,500 cases of past life memories in children suggestive of reincarnation. I mean, this entire huge body of evidence uh, tells us that we are much more than just our physical bodies and that our free will plays a tremendous role in the evolution of all humanity. And as we shift our worldviews to one that's more consciousness-based, it implies our togetherness, that we're all in this and that we're in it together. And therefore, all of our choices ideally manifest love, compassion, kindness, acceptance and mercy on all fellow beings. And we have a shared purpose. And I think that all of that is a tremendous, refreshing uh, uh, shift from the materialist worldview that's held sway for so long and yet should have gone extinct more than 80 years ago with the advent of quantum physics. Absolutely. When coming down to the personal experience, how, how did it change you on a, on, a, on a fundamental personal level when you came back from that coma? Well, important to point out, as I mentioned earlier, my brain was really wrecked. It took me about two months to recover. And in fact, I had a more than complete recovery. Uh, and it was just an astonishing gift. Uh, initially, I assumed, you know, none of my neuroscience knowledge was there and I knew nothing of my medical uh, records uh, when I first came back to this world. So that was a process of, of recovering that information over months of going back to visit my doctors and all that. And that's when I started realizing that things were very, very different from just, oh, the dying brain plays all kinds of tricks. Because the medical evidence was there, as is pointed out in that case report, that my brain shouldn't have been able to do anything of the sort. And so it's been an extraordinary journey that has been a tremendous uh, relief, to tell you the truth, because it really brings us much more together and supports a far more common purpose uh, for humanity to really be stewards of this earth and not uh, to, to kind of continue to uh, honor our little egocentric uh, kind of materialist wealth acquisition kind of ideas, but to see that the highest good comes from helping others and benefiting all of life on earth. And that is a tremendous uh, uh, benefit to come to that realization. Yet that's where the science leads us. All of us will come to that conclusion over the next uh, few decades. That's beautiful, isn't it? It really is living from the heart. But speaking for, about the heart, is there any science around the heart-based living as in the heart as another brain? Because I always think we have sort of three brains, don't we? Is, are you guys looking into the science of the, the, the heart as a, a potential house of consciousness as well? Well, the, the science of the heart and the, my experience with the heart has been one of my greatest teachers. And it's HeartMath Institute in California who ha has been studying the heart for decades. And there are so many heart math practitioners from around the world who know this information. And when I speak about it in, in, our, in our presentation, so many people start nodding their heads. So this isn't <laughs> new information in, in, on the one hand, and yet it hasn't really been integrated into our, into our kind of secular understanding. And what they have found is that the heart emits an electromagnetic field and it expands and contracts around our bodies. It's actually 3000 times bigger than the brains in the magnetic portion and 60 times greater than the brains in the electric portion. And so that's a very large field, relatively speaking. It expands and contracts around our bodies based on our emotional state. So if you're joy, 
you know, happy field, then you'll have a very expansive field. And this field seems to affect the people around you. So they have done studies where someone, all they do is generate a feeling of gratitude in the heart, not thoughts of gratitude, but feelings. Heart math calls that a coherence technique. And sitting across the table from someone else, they're able to affect their physiological heart rate variability and their brainwave state. But we all know those people, if you, especially if you work in an office or, or some setting where you see the same people every day, who come into the office complaining about traffic or weather, and they kind of bring the energy down. We don't, we don't really want to interact with those people. And then there's those that come in with a big smile and they're happy. Eben has that kind of presence. And, uh, you know, it really uplifts people. So what is that? Part of that is that electromagnetic field, that thing that we feel in other people. And so the more of us who can become aware of it and how it affects people around us, we always talk about, you know, service to others or love others as you would love yourself. Well, if we can learn to generate those feelings of gratitude from within, those feelings of love and connection without all the vulnerability and the hurts that so many of us hold, as we can do this, I like to call this the ultimate golden rule, because as you're generating that love from within, of course, you're affecting your own physiology and mood and well-being, but you're also affecting the people around you without having to say a word. And so I feel as though if children grew up knowing this and brought this into their adult lives, and it's never too late as adults, we can learn this. I certainly did. It took a lot of kind of clearing out of old hurts and pains in order to really find that pure essence within that all of us have. This is what makes us human. This is what connects us. Our heart energy is constantly connecting with those around us and we don't even realize. So bringing more awareness to that and consciously creating those joy and happy feelings from within really do serve to help our fellow humans in amazing ways. And it really shows the interconnectedness of everything, isn't it? Um, I'm being nudged to kind of talk to you guys about an experience that I had in 2012, which kind of does feed into a lot of this work that you guys are doing. Um, there are a lot of different people bringing through different systems that are accelerating people into their ascended consciousness, if you will, into their div divine consciousness. Um, 2012, I channeled a system called Precious Wisdom, which works very much with symbolism and sacred geometry and a little bit with sound, Karen. And, we, and I do want to talk to you about your sacred acoustics as well. Um, but I had an experience the morning I was given an, an attunement with these mudra and symbols that I never studied before in my life, but was just given a download of it. I had an experience where my heart basically opened, it burst open with a, an electrical pulse of such love, I, I couldn't even put it into words. And I have, I have these fully embodied visions. I've never done plant medicine, but I think I must have a lot of DMT in my brain because I have fully embodied waking visions. And I was taken, uh, actually I wasn't taken anywhere. I was very much in my body, but I was shown the universe completely opened up into geometric uh, like tunnels going off in every direction. And I saw all these different beings and um, uh, versions really of myself looking back at me. It took me a little while to realize they were all versions of me. It was like the entire unified field of my own consciousness opened in like probably a split second, but it felt like it went on for an eternity. It was pure love. And I realized that all these versions of me were sending me love and I had to send it back. And it became this beautiful, really like unspeakably beautiful experience. And it all happened through the heart and through this gift of this attunement that I was given. So in terms of your own work, I'm, I know that you, you obviously studied the science and everything of the heart. But with your sacred acoustics work, how does that ex kind of accelerate you into these higher states of consciousness? Well, you bring up a point, you know, the science helps us kind of understand how it works, but it's the firsthand direct experience where we actually really learn and come to know. And so your beautiful experience of connecting with that love 
very familiar to me. Not necessarily, <laughs> sure. Yeah, not necessarily in the same way, but I agree with you. These kinds of experiences where we tap into that love are so difficult to explain because we don't have words for it because it's a feeling sense. And Eben had the same thing in his near-death experience and so many others who've had it through that method. But my connections were similar to yours, more from awakenings or performing certain techniques or, or what have you, or getting to a particular emotional state where I could become more vulnerable. But where this sound has come in for me, uh, you know, the, the other heart study that I did was a particular form of Sufi heart rhythm meditation, where you actually time your breathing with your heart and, and do all kinds of kind of imagine your breath is coming in and out of your heart in different directions and so on. But um, I combined that with the sound in amazing ways. I came across sound in the first place because when I first tried to meditate, my mind would just race and race. And sound was the thing that really helped me to calm those racing thoughts, specifically binaural beats or brainwave entrainment technology. And I met someone who was interested in the same thing, Kevin Cossey, and he and I had partnered to create these recordings for our own personal journeys. And it was when we met Eben, and he wanted to bring tools to the world to learn how to experience these kind of effects without having to almost die. That's where we kind of came together over the sound. So this particular sound really helps to bring I'll say your linguistic or ego self kind of into another state. So when you can bring the body into pure relaxation as if the body is asleep, but the mind is still aware and alert, that's where you can kind of find that between worlds kind of state. And we're all in that state as we're falling asleep at night or waking up in the morning. But the sacred acoustics audio recordings help people to get into what's called that hypnagogic state without, you know, with a little more assistance. So it's kind of like a, a, a meditation tool, but it's also a journeying tool, an, an opportunity to kind of put your physical self aside and the sound seems to activate things inside of you. And at first, I was act what was activated were my old emotions, the traumas. And so the sound along with the heart awareness were able to help me really identify those things and then set upon a path to release them. Now, other people use the tones for focus or to help them sleep. Uh, some people have had success using them to induce out-of-body experiences. There's a wide range of experiences people can have, all the way from just reducing anxiety, which a pilot study and a clinical practice, psychiatric practice in Manhattan has shown a 26% result reduction in anxiety is something our world could desperately use right now. But it can also be used as a tool for spiritual exploration. And so it really just depends on the person's personal goals and where they want to take it. We're all very unique. We're all on different paths. We're going to find our way to these universal truths in different ways. And the sound can help us and, uh, and as another technique to use along the way. And one other thing I'd like to point out about the sound from a neuroscientific viewpoint is most of the sounds we've ever heard, and certainly that includes chants and anthems, hymns, uh, the kind of sounds that we might have used to induce transcendental states of, of uh, spirituality or in a religious practice, what have you. Uh, those are all processed in the neocortex, up in circuits that have arisen in the last one to 10 million years. So they're very new circuits in evolution. However, the sounds of sacred acoustics, like other binaural beats, have a direct impact on the lower brainstem. This is on circuits that arose more than 300 million years ago, before mammals were even present on Earth. And I believe that's one of the reasons why these binaural beats, and especially sacred acoustics in my experience, have such a profound ability to liberate our conscious awareness and basically let us put that little ego voice that Karen was talking about minutes ago, uh, put that little voice into time out. Because our consciousness, the deep mystery of consciousness, is not that running stream of thoughts in our head, but it's the awareness of them. And in our workshops, our meditation play shops, we often help people uh, quickly get to a point where they can differentiate between that little ego voice, the linguistic voice in the head, kind of the voice of rational, logical thought, 
and the awareness of it. And once you can separate those and start following that awareness, that leads you into the primordial mind of the universe. And that's where we can have tremendous insight and influence on our emerging reality. It, it, that is so fascinating to hear you say that because I have, um, in, my, in my healings, I've started doing a type of psychic surgery which brings in light language and sound. And it, in my experience of light language, it's not a, it's not a linear language. It's not a, a logical, rational language it's almost like speaking in a kind of frequency what it's enabling me to do in my sessions with people is that rather than sort of sit and chat about what's going on i can actually feel into their energy field it's like a homing beacon and feel where there are say trapped emotions and things it's like we become one consciousness then it's like a merged field mm -hmm. and then i'm able to bring in this frequency my hands sometimes go and then i'm able to literally pull stuff out of their energy field that that shouldn't be there, whether that's trapped emotions or even entities and things like that, that, that are sort of just of a different frequency. I don't like to put judgment on it, but talking to you guys about the science of it is absolutely fascinating to me because it's something that's just become second nature in my own journey of awakened consciousness. But I always think of myself as my own guinea pig. And so I'm always like fascinated by the science of it. And I think that, talking to you about the sound and the, these, these kind of otherworldly state or other, other states of consciousness that we can access by sort of not, not so much bypassing the logical brain, but by working with another kind of a brain, working with another aspect of ourselves. So if, have you guys studied the light language at all? Are you guys looking into that? And is there a, like a scientific explanation for it? I am very familiar with the light language um, through several traditions and experiences that I've had. I've known others who have, I'll say, channeled that light language. And it's, it's very interesting to me when, when I hear it because people, it's so pure. It's so uh, like untainted by language and uh, music theory and all of the things we've done here to kind of wrestle music and sound into a, a system you know that's what we do but light language comes through as you say it's not linear it's got a, a, a whole other quality and i feel it works with that you know law of resonance where when you're interacting with a certain person that there so much of a physical body is also accompanied by an energetic body and that's where i think the sound vibrations really start to interact with that energetic part of the person's system. And so when you can open yourself up and allow those sounds to come through, as you're saying, one consciousness with that other being, you're really just connecting and resonating with energies in their system and then trying to bring it more into that pure state, that more, uh, you know, the judgment is hard here because, you know, we're all perfect on one level, but it, you're bringing them more into alignment, I would say, with who they truly are with your voice. And that is absolutely amazing. Our sound is very controlled by computer, digital, you know, making sure every frequency is aligned with another to bring a different kind of power. But the voice is kind of the other end of that spectrum where it can really just be free to uh, kind of express what needs to be expressed in that given moment for that given soul that you're interacting with. And so I feel these two kind of probably ends of the spectrum as far as sound healing goes are also very complementary. And so wh whereas you can use that voice to affect one person at a time, I'm always interested. And we do have one recording in the Sacred Acoustics Library. It's called Love Body. And as we were wow. creating that recording, this is where I wanted to create a recording where people could imagine the love of source entering their crown chakra into their heart chakra and resonate with the love inside their body. And so with my audio engineer, I was trying to get him to create a sound of love. And that's kind of challenging. Um, you know, he would come up with little tinkly sounds and it just wasn't quite right. And and that same week I was, I received an email from a friend uh, of ours who said, I have this friend who does light language and I think you guys should work together. Mm -hmm. And I, I immediately connected with her. Her name's Yamanya Carey. And I said, do you think you could use your light language to channel the sound of love from source? 
And so she did. And that has now been included into our love body recording. So it's a very powerful thing. It felt more like that love vibration needed to come from a human voice uh, channeling that energy as opposed to trying to wrestle a frequency to represent it into the recording. And so the value of both came together in that love body recording. That's stunning. I'll have to have a listen. Um, Eben, did you, were you aware of sounds uh, in your experience? Absolutely. I mean, in my near-death experience, I talk about um, how sound, vibration, frequency is really, it's kind of the instrument that our souls use to traverse multiple realms. I mean, the the spiritual realm is multi-layered all the way from you know, the most uh, superficial parts that are associated with this material realm, all the way to the pure oneness of infinity and eternity of the God force at the core of all existence, which I would say is the very origin of each and every one of our conscious awareness. Um, But sound was absolutely essential. Now, of course, remember, sound is not in those realms is not heard with the ears or you don't see with the eyes and we don't have the brain there to kind of filter everything out. So you're experiencing a kind of conscious experience and what I call knowledge through identification by becoming huge swathes of the scene around you. But the tool that we have to traverse those realms is sound. That's what I used in getting from the Earthworm's Eye View, the very primitive course kind of underground realm where my journey started up into the brilliant ultra real uh, gateway valley was through a portal uh, that was a pure light but it was associated with a perfect musical melody Uh, and of course I described the the beauty of that realm that had many earth-like features in the book Proof of Heaven but the important point to make here is that the angelic choirs above these swooping orbs of pure spiritual energy that were emanating chants and anthems and hymns that were thundering through me in that gateway valley, those angelic choirs provided yet another portal to higher and higher levels, all the way out to what I call the core, infinite inky blackness, but filled to overflowing with the divine love of that God force. I called it a dazzling darkness. Uh, it's, it's where all paradox comes together into oneness. But the uh, way to traverse those realms is something I remember very clearly as certain sounds. And I could use those sounds to re-engineer my kind of moving through those realms during the experience itself. So yes, sound is absolutely essential uh, in our spiritual journeys, even though it's, it's a sound that goes far beyond anything we could ever imagine based on our exposure to sound in a four-dimensional space-time where physics limits what is possible. In those worlds, it, it, it's why uh, the music uh, is often described as so uh, completely magical and ethereal and, and nothing that could be reproduced in this earthly realm uh, because it's not bounded by the physics or our four-dimensional space-time. But believe me, sound is an absolutely crucial tool in uh, traversing those realms. And that's why it's so important that you know this work with Karen started uh, basically about three years after my coma and has been revolutionary in my understanding, the sacred acoustics. I use sacred acoustics tones an hour to a day. Uh, I use it often to return to my near-death experience and not just to recover memories of it, but to actually expand on my relationships with the various entities, guides, teachers, uh, wisdom, and especially of that infinitely loving God force. Uh, And I can return to that often through meditation. Now, it's It doesn't always happen because uh, I have to wait until the universe is ready to offer me up certain things that I ask for. But uh, I've learned to trust in the universe tremendously. And sooner or later, I usually get uh, what I'm requesting. And in terms of the guides and the beings that you've connected with in that realm, do you you often get visitation here now um, on a regular basis since that experience? I would say for me, it's still limited to my meditations. Although I will have, you know, just my normal waking, uh, walking around life, I will have uh, occasional messages like uh, in, in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe, I describe how I encountered the soul of my father. He was not there in my original NDE, which to me was a big mystery. And of course, those who read Proof of Heaven will realize I did have a guardian angel 
but she was someone who I could never have predicted would be my guardian angel. And that, of course, is why I think so many people find Proof of Heaven to be such a powerful, convincing, and amazing story. It's because of how it comes to an end with that beautiful guardian angel who was a surprise to me. And yet, uh, I, I often interact with all of them now. Uh, you know, my father's soul has become a very important guide. And, and I first met him um, years after my coma in, in a meditation using sound similar to sacred acoustics. It was kind of a precursor to sacred acoustics. Um, but uh, I don't really encounter them uh, like right now, sitting here in my normal waking state. It's not like all of a sudden I'll have this beautiful kind of interaction and conversation with, with my father's soul, with uh, the beautiful guardian angel who was there on the butterfly wing. Um, but in deep meditation, of course, like I said, I do that uh, an hour, two or three a day, however much time I have. Uh, but yes, there I have a very fertile interaction with, uh, with those realms and those guides and with uh, the beautiful sources of creativity and of understanding, uh, you know, and following a soul journey. That kind of information is essential. You can't just think your way to it with that linguistic brain of yours. Mm -hmm. It's almost like you're... You, I think many of us have these experiences, whether it's an NDE or whether it's just a, a rapid awakening. There are, there, are, there are certain people that I think it's a very rapid um, sort of blowing you open kind of experience, isn't it? And it's like, as we know, once you've had an experience like that, you can't go backwards. You can't no, get put back in the box. And, and, not put the genie and, back in the box. <laughs> no, never. Um, well, I have to say, like, I, I work as a channel and I am a very much a seer. And I can feel and sense and see many beings around us now that are of multi levels. And I can actually see with, with you, kind of from sort of around your shoulders here, there is this huge portal of light that goes up, probably from your heart, like a cone going all the way up and it's like it's open to the whole spectrum and we all have that but what they're kind of saying to me is that yours is permanently open you are a bit of a gateway um and i feel sorry i don't mean to read you while we're in the middle of the, <laughs> the interview they're just sort of saying this is important um that in terms of uh what well, kind of think they want me to ask you about in terms of where we're going in terms of the, the structures of healthcare and politics and government and the money system and everything, where do you see us going? Because it feels like you're very much involved in this and you're going to be very much involved in this. And there are beings here that want to help with the work that you guys are doing. Um, so I want to hear a little bit about your vision and what you would like to see happen on that world stage, both of you. Well, I think that uh, the COVID pandemic is actually a beautiful gift, uh, a silver lining kind of in disguise around this dark cloud of what we're experiencing uh, in the destruction of our economic systems and in all of the kind of suffering uh, and anxiety and fear. Uh, these are all things that can actually energize our growth. Um, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of my life personally kind of in and out of the kind of addiction and alcoholism world. I, I myself stopped drinking back in 1991. Um, and to me, that was a beautiful gift, and not the recovery from alcohol, but actually the, uh, the gift of having that challenge. Uh, and, and it's something we refer to in alcoholism and addiction work as a gift of desperation. And in many ways, I see this COVID pandemic, uh, Karen and I often talk about this, uh, as a, uh, uh, a, a group gift of desperation uh, for all of us, for this whole world. And it exposes a lot of the the really kind of broken uh, safety net that we had for our society. Uh, you know, our economies have, have really grown in, in the last few decades, but not everyone has been included uh, in that gift of growth. And our healthcare system, especially here in the U.S., uh, although it's very expensive, it's very kind of broken and misguided in many ways. It needs tremendous kind of overhaul that's more heart-based and more kind of care-based, more there to take care of each other. And instead of having that materialist uh, focus of separatism where, you know, the guy with the most toys at the end of the day wins, we realize those rules don't really ap apply to this world where consciousness is fundamental and we're all part of one soul and we're all here together to share in spirit and love. And we find that the greatest gifts in terms of loving ourselves is really serving as a conduit for love for the rest of the world. And that includes the practical goals of repairing our 
polarized economic system, political systems, healthcare systems, uh, the refugee crisis, warfare, all these things, climate change, every bit of that stands to improve dramatically from lessons that we can learn from this COVID pandemic. So I'm very optimistic about where I think it's going to lead us, but we have to grow into that. We have to mature into that kind of uh, soul that's uh, uh, viewing the common good as, as the worthy goal. And I would just add that, you know, for, I don't know how long I've been hearing about prophecies from ancient indigenous cultures, from spiritual traditions, about a shift in consciousness that was coming to our world. And of course, we all remember Y2K, when all the computers would fail, and 2012, to. yeah, 2012 <laughs> was uh, the Mayans calendar date. And, you know, we, we end up getting let down. Oh, nothing happened. And well, how does an individual transform? Transformation comes through direct personal experience, usually involving some sort of hardship. And so if our world is truly to transform, a hardship is almost required. And so it's so interesting that we're all in, through the entire globe going through this moment at once. And this truly is that opportunity for us to view this hardship as a learning experience, a transformational experience, as a global community. And so for years, Eben and I have been saying, you know, before all this happened, that that shift in consciousness was coming. We couldn't know exactly when, but there would be a time when people started to realize there's more to to this than just our physical world and to stop denying the reality of soul and spirit. And what we learned was that potentially right before a shift like that, we would actually see a rise in the polarities, a rise in the two sides sort of coming up and getting all of the attention. And that, of course, we've been seeing in our US and other political structures around the world, this rise in the two extreme sides. And you know, my and our goal has always been unity. What do we have in common? How can we come together to really bring the world that all of us need? It's not us against them. We're all humans. We're all connected as one consciousness, one soul, one mind, one heart. How can we survive by focusing on our differences? And so, you know, I always say that when uh, like hurricane coverage happens here in the U.S. on the news, it's all this buildup to the danger that's coming and, you know, everybody, you know, get in your homes and be careful, go to the shelters. And then afterwards, the destruction is over. It all happens very quickly in a matter of hours or, or a couple days. And then there's the aftermath. And that's when the tragedy of broken homes and maybe some lost lives have taken place, but also so many heartwarming stories of people coming together to help each other. It seems then the political divides and other divides aren't so uh, as apparent, it, but people come and they help feed each other, house each other, you know, help people they may not have even realized were their neighbors, you know, the week before. And so this is that opportunity that we now have now. And there's all of this flailing leadership happening here and there. I, I don't want to get too political, uh, but we don't feel like we have strong leadership that cares about all of humanity. That's what's missing. But we, the people, we are consciousness. We collectively bring it all together. I love how in your love vision that you saw yourself as the one that was bringing you that love. That is such a beautiful thing because we are not separate from each other. When you view that love, you should be viewing it as an aspect of yourself. That's how it works because we are all one big giant self all bundled up together. We're just a little confused right now about our individual purposes. And the way we view it is that each of us is, Eben often says, a facet on a diamond. Each of us is unique and yet a part of a whole that without that uniqueness, we wouldn't be whole. And so that's why we also often say no soul left behind. All souls are part of this journey. All souls will need to move forward together if we're, we're to see some progress. And so this is our opportunity. And I want to take this moment to share that Eben and I began a series of free webinars specifically to address this topic and to bring people together from around the globe in love 
connection and spirit. We're physically apart, but we don't need to be spiritually apart. And it doesn't matter what your religion is or if you even have one. We connect through that binding force of love through the heart and that realization that we're all in this together. And so that webinar series you can find at unitedinhopeandhealing.com. And uh, we hope to continue doing this and bringing guests on. And every uh, webinar, every other week, we lead people through a meditation called United Souls of Earth. And we supply a free 20-minute sacred acoustics recording that contains that guidance so that people can do that on their own. And we've started an initiative that at 11 a.m. every day from whatever time zone you're in to generate that feeling of gratitude, knowing that it is emanating to the world around you. I imagine this wave of global love that might take place. And for all those who are not really in a place where they can feel that gratitude, people who are in a really difficult, challenging situation uh, for all of the various reasons, that's the moment at 11 a.m. that they can receive the love that all the other humans in the world are sending in that moment. And so just opening your heart and realizing that love is out there, you just need to open yourself to it. And that is something we hope that this COVID pandemic will help bring to the world. And when we start to solve the you know, problems in the world with the economic disparities, the climate and such, what we'll be doing is bringing love to those solutions. We're not suggesting that love alone will do it, but bringing love to our actions will create a much, much different solution than one that doesn't bring that love. That's beautiful. I'm going to share, I'll share all the links below as well so people can go through and, and, and sign up and click through. Um, the other thing that I kind of feel as well as the love is the truth aspect, isn't it? It's about coming to our own truth. And I find that what's happening at the moment is you have the, the distortion between the false news and not really knowing who to trust, like the wolves in sheep's clothing and vice versa and people playing the villain and stuff on the, in that stage. It's like we're really all being forced to go, oh, um, maybe I'm looking at the wrong authority here. Maybe I need to come back to my own heart and my own truth. Um, the, and the other thing about the shared consciousness, I know that years ago I interviewed Dr. Raymond Moody, who I'm sure you, you are familiar with, and um, I spoke to him a little bit about shared death experience. And I feel like as a, as a global community, we're sort of going through the shared death of our old world, aren't we, in a way? Um, can you, Evan, can you talk to us a little bit about shared death experience from you? Yeah, they're, they're actually uh, beautiful. They're a similar quality to near-death experiences. Um, and, and many had the very same features. Uh, and yet they happen to people who were normally physiologically perfectly healthy. Uh, and uh, Dr. Moody wrote his beautiful book, Glimpses of Eternity, which is all about shared death. Um, and shared death is something I'm sure many people in your audience have experienced. Uh, it can happen, say, when one's uh, uh, parent who may, may be at a distance and, and leaves the physical world, uh, their soul comes through, uh, that other bystander soul, you know, the, the loved one. And often that soul then goes along with the, the departing soul, even to the point of witnessing a full-blown life review. Life reviews are described in 25 to 50 percent of near-death experiences uh, going back thousands of years. So life review is, has always uh, been a kind of a, a common feature and uh, uh, kind of astonishing that people can have that kind of a spiritual experience uh, where they witness their loved one going through a life review and then their soul comes back to this world. Uh, I know when I first started giving talks about my uh, Proof of Heaven experience, which was two years before the book came out, uh, I would often have people come up to me afterwards and share their stories of their own near-death experience. But about one in 20 of them were a very powerful shared death experience. I didn't even know what to call it back then, but uh, it was after that that, I, uh, that Raymond wrote uh, that book, Glimpses of Eternity, and then I realized they actually have a name. And since then, uh, I've encountered many more people who have them. They Basically, one of the most uh, valuable aspects of the shared death experience is it completely obliterates 
those uh, medical pseudo explanations that an NDE is due to, you know, de declining oxygen tension in the brain or build up of CO2 or some other kind of pseudo explanation that really doesn't cover it at all. Because these people who have a shared death experience are, nor are physiologically usually normal. Uh, there's nothing wrong with their oxygen or CO2. Their brain is not threatened with imminent demise. And yet they have this profound spiritual journey escorting their loved one to the other side. Uh, they're really shocking. It's beautiful. I've had it myself. I do a little bit of soul midwife work and I've had one myself. It touches you. You can't, you can't ever forget something like that. Just as I think when you've been through a hardship and like Karen was talking about, you can see it in people's eyes, I think. You know, the, you, you see it when people have actually been sort of opened up. There's a light, there's a, there's a quality, which I can see in both of you, obviously. Um, I just wanted to, I know that I've been talking to you for ages. I could talk to you forever. Um, I just wanted to ask you both in your, in your own words, what is consciousness? Just a small question. <laughs> well, I would, I would uh, my answer to that would be consciousness is exactly what you think it is. It's your awareness of existing. So mm -hmm. our consciousness is nothing more magical than being here in this moment um, and existing, but also, of course, having access to memories of past events or past thoughts and also kind of projections of future intentions and things like that. But consciousness is that little awareness that each and every human being, and I would say animals going all the way down the evolutionary chain, have a, a consciousness. In fact, theirs can even be richer and more spiritually connected than human consciousness because we have this little linguistic brain, which is a little piece about that big, uh, but it tends to dominate. I, we even call the left hemisphere and a right-handed person the dominant hemisphere because that's where our language which lives. Uh, but that's why I love how Michael Singer puts it in his book, uh, The Untethered Soul. He calls that little running stream of thoughts in our head, our stream of consciousness, the annoying roommate. Do not <laughs> think that that is your, quote, consciousness. Your consciousness is the awareness of that. And that is the part that, to me, expands tremendously when you're freed from the shackles of the prison of the physical brain and body, for example, at the time of death. But we can all use meditation to come to develop a rich relationship with that kind of higher soul, that uh, aspect of conscious awareness that goes beyond the little ego and the little voice in the head. Uh, and we can use that tremendously to glean information about uh, our role in the universe, our purpose, and to help us achieve it, especially through acting in this world. So it's not just about going within, centering prayer and meditation uh, to get these uh, kind of loving connections, but it's how we then choose to act in our dealings with everyone else, how we choose to live our days is all something that is ideally uh, originates in that beautiful realm of pure love and connectedness and oneness. Beautifully put. Karen, how about you in your words? Well, all of that I, rings very true. I always think of consciousness as our awareness, but how aware are we of that consciousness? And so I kind of think of it as maybe uh, bubbles that kind of build on each other out. So you can be aware of, I guess you would call it your local consciousness, but as you become more expanded, more uh, aware of maybe what's beyond your local consciousness, it kind of grows and grows out and out until some point you can actually connect with that primordial consciousness. So when, when Evan often says, you know, consciousness is primordial, consciousness mm -hmm. was here before physical matter and this and physical matter emerged from consciousness so i always return to that fundamental state of consciousness that feeling state that curiosity state that i wonder what's out there kind of state what else is there and consciousness then expanded to discover more about itself that one consciousness by creating all of these individual consciousnesses to have all of the many possible experiences that are possible. So it's really amazing for me to think about if consciousness is fundamental, that whole creation, why are we here? What is our purpose? This is that existential question that so many of us ask when we're in these hardships. What is the meaning of all of this? And so when you go back to why all of this exists, that consciousness is why. And that consciousness, I imagine, is that 
you know, I can only imagine it from this human point of view, right? I can't know mm -hmm. what consciousness might have felt then, but from that human point of view, I would use words like curiosity. And certainly I go through my life as a human, very curious about those things. Why are we here? What is our purpose? <laughs> And, that is so what, like. <laughs> yeah. and that's what drives so yeah. many of us, especially when we reach these uh, hardships. I believe there's probably more people on earth right now asking those existential questions because of what we're all going through. People losing their businesses, they've spent their lives to build. Uh, people losing their lives right and left, healthcare workers. On the, I mean, it's just unbelievable the stress we're mm -hmm. all under. And so that's when people start to awaken. And I've found that people who already have a practice of going within or kind of have an understanding of this greater spirituality are having an easier time getting through this crisis. I believe when we were talking to our psychiatrist co colleague up in New York, who actually contracted COVID-19 herself along with her husband. They're now nicely recovering, but she was very busy supporting the mental health needs of her fellow New Yorkers. And what she found was that the biggest reason that people were starting to think about taking their own lives, committing suicide, was boredom. They did not know what to do with themselves when they were sitting at home without things to do, like go to the gym and concerts. They were left to their own consciousness, shall we say, and it made them uncomfortable. And so I, I'm seeing that people who don't have this level of understanding are having a slight, this a broad generality, but they are having a slightly more challenging time. And it is, from my point of view, their opportunity to learn these lessons that all of humanity must learn if we're going to grow and evolve together. And that is what we hope that all of this will, will bring that opportunity. I love it. We always learn through relationship. In this realm, it's duality, isn't it? And that includes our relationship to self. And I think if you haven't yet cultivated that relationship, that deeper relationship and understanding with yourself, it must be a struggle, really. So bless them. Bless everyone. I think... Um, this is absolutely a time where we all need to be in it together. And I, I just want to say bless you both for the work you're doing. It's absolutely wonderful. And I'm so pleased to have you on this show to talk about it. I think the more, the more people that understand um, everything that you're teaching and, and other ways that they can tap into their own consciousness is even better, more empowering for everyone. And can I just add one thing? When you spoke a moment ago, very briefly, the, the truth factor, how do we know what's true? Well, that was the case before we had all of this misinformation and shall I even say propaganda being thrown in our faces and really causing a lot of confusion. And you spoke precisely to how we can solve that problem. And that is to go within and feel what's true. We mm -hmm. can look for all the experts and find our trusted sources, but in the end, we need to feel comfortable about what that truth is. And that truth comes from that authenticity inside that can really know what's true rather than our mind trying to figure it all out. So I think that was a beautiful key that you brought to that discussion. I just wanted to point out. Oh, thank you. Lovely. Oh, bless you both. I'm so pleased to meet you. Um, hopefully we will be in touch for, for more years to come. And um, just so people know how to find you, could you share your websites and, um, and any links that they might need to access your teachings? Well, you can find more out about the sound at sacredacoustics.com and our webinar series is at unitedinhopeandhealing.com. And, and people can go to ebenalexander.com, that's E-B-E-N Alexander, uh, to learn much more about, uh, you know, our, our books. Um, and, are, you, uh, are you planning any new books at the moment? By the well, way. I, I must say, I'm, I'm coming to realize that I, I, we really need, or I really need, I don't want to put words in Karen's mouth, but, <laughs> uh, because in fact, since living in a mindful universe, uh, I've had uh, uh, quite a bit of revelation about how to tie it all together. I mean, in, the, in that book, we make a strong argument for the reality of objective idealism. That is, the universe works mainly from a level of the mental uh, the physical universe is derivative from that. And we use arguments from uh, psychology, from parapsychology, from um, uh, all the evidence for non-local consciousness. So 
We bring in evidence from quantum physics. I mean, all of it ties together to show this primacy of mind and the, and the uh, oneness of consciousness. But it really and truly, as Karen so often reminds me, it's about heart consciousness. It's about that loving binding force. Uh, and you really, you know, I've been in many scientific discussions about the one mind and many scientists will agree to the evidence that there's really one mind that we're all sharing. Uh, but uh, the piece that sometimes eludes them if they haven't had personal experience is how it is all meaningless without the notion of uh, infinite uh, healing power of unconditional love. Uh, because that really is the essence of what, what joins us all together. And uh, I think the biggest gift to be recovered uh, kind of in scientific sensibilities is about that importance of love in a very concrete uh, fashion. Um, in sharing the one mind. And we're all in this together. And, and that love will lead us towards that deeper truth. This is a resonance that many people can feel. Um, but that's what it's all about, is uh, for everybody to get on board with this incredible awakening of humanity. Absolutely stunning. I'm going to be sharing this interview with my dad because years ago when I started going through my spiritual awakening, my scientist doctor father was like, what's all this mumbo jumbo you're talking about, Al? And I I remember asking him, well, Dad, when you go to the hospital and you treat your patients, what's the key factor that makes them heal? And he thought about it and he said, oh, it's my bedside manner. It's, it's the fact that I care. It's the fact that I believe they can heal. And I said, yes. exactly, exactly. And he's now having his own awakening. It's, it's, it's beautiful. But Oh, I will let you go and get on with your day. I thank you so much, both of you. Um, I, I hope that we have a part two of this at some point in the future. And um, obviously, um, I'll be sharing all your information below. But um, for all our viewers watching, thank you so much for joining in the Alexandra Wenman Show. Eben and Karen, an absolute delight. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much for having us. It's been great talking with you. And yes, I hope we can do it again someday. Yes, so much more to talk about. and. Uh... Thank you for what you do, bringing these messages to others, because we need you, too, to, to reach more right. souls. No soul left behind, and we're all helping every human come to this realization. Thank you. We're all in it together, aren't we, guys? We are. Namaste. <laughs> Namaste. <laughs>